All right, who wants to talk about servers? Are servers exciting? Woo! No, 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 I don't believe that for a second. They're boring. Although we do have a really hot data center, so. All right, it's all downhill from here. All right, so uh, at Kama, we train models, machine learning models for open pilots. Uh, and we always want to train bigger models faster, iterate faster. Um, and so we need lots of servers to do that. This is a picture of our prior office. We moved to a new office recently. And this is what we used to have for servers for training models. And um, you can't really see the servers because this is in a really dirty garage. And um, the only way to really filter the air with a giant garage door and all kinds of stuff going on in there was to put filter media right on the front of the servers to try to keep the dirt um, from going into the servers. So uh, you can see here, this is a four car garage. There's room for four cars and the servers take up less than one car spot. So really not a lot of space here for our servers. Um, this is about 5.68 petaflops of bfloat 16 performance. Uh, we measure everything in bfloat 16 because that's what our models are and so that's all we really care about. Um, this whole room or this slice of the garage, we spent about $500,000 on the servers, getting power in here and the ventilation and everything. So in the old office, we ran out of power. We couldn't handle the amount of heat we were generating. Um, this, the whole building only had about 200 amps of power. That tiny panel in the picture on the right there is all the power for the whole building. Um, the ventilation was the best we could do. We had a skylight up in the top, and we had an intake and an exhaust fan that were up in the ceiling. Um, you can see the skylight on the left there. I kind of propped it open because I needed more airflow because the skylight's pretty restrictive, and for a good reason, we don't want rain coming down in on our servers. But when it was really hot, I would maybe try to prop it open and get a little more, get a little more airflow. Um, so it wasn't great. We ran out of power. We didn't have enough airflow. We wanted to train models faster. We wanted to buy more servers. We didn't have the power. More, uh, we wanted to buy more servers. More servers means more power. More power means more heat. So we moved to a new office. Uh, a big criteria for the new office was way more power. We found a place with 8x the power of our previous office. And for the first time, the servers are not in a garage. They have a room. <laughs> so uh, this is the room that we chose. Uh, it started out empty. It was not, obviously, it wasn't for servers. The first thing we did was we ran uh, 800 amps of power into the room. Uh, this was pretty expensive. We spent, for all the electrical work in the room, we ended up spending about $125,000. Um, the power was kind of on the wrong corner of the building for the servers, so it was quite a ways we had to run the power and stuff. Uh, but thank goodness we had a place with lots of power, so now we can run lots more servers. So in this room, we added a couple short walls. These walls are basically to help with hot aisle, uh, containing the hot aisle, some partial walls. The racks obviously go in between those walls there. We have these 42U racks that we use. We knocked out some windows. So uh, I guess I didn't really explain it, but just like in our last data center, we only had fans. It was a garage, no air conditioning. We're in San Diego and uh, we can potentially save a ton of money not using air conditioning. Um, so what we do is we, we just use fans. You can see the windows boarded up here. And then we installed some really big fans. Uh, these are, oh, thanks. Yeah, I guess the fans are more exciting than the servers, huh? The, uh, the fans are three horsepower. Each fan does about 28,000 CFM. Uh, the room's pretty small. We can exchange all the air in the room in less than 10 seconds. So these are quite powerful. Then inside the room, this is one of those hot aisle containment walls. We also have some fans that recirculate air. So we can basically take the hot air and bring it back to the cold aisle when we need to, um, because sometimes we need to raise the temperature on the cold aisle. Uh, I said our data center is hot. We run a high temperature data center. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, so sometimes it's not hot enough in our data center and we make it hotter. And then the last thing was uh, we just use a strip curtain, anti-static 
strip curtain to kind of seal off from the uh, from the front side, from the ceiling to the top of the server or to the floor, if uh, if there's no servers in the racks in certain in certain racks. Then the last thing is um, we want to make sure that the air temperature from the ceiling all the way to the floor is a very similar temperature. Uh, I'll get into more um, the humidity and why, but basically we need an even temperature so we have even humidity. Uh, all the way from the floor to the ceiling. So these are called destratification fans. They just suck air in from the ceiling and they push it back down to the floor to even out the temperature. So this is what the room looks like after we built that all out. Uh, there's two intake fans on the ends that bring in air from the outside. The air goes through the servers, through the racks, and then there's two uh, big fans that shoot the heat out the back. And then on the sides there's Two recirculation fans, and you can see those recirculation fans are kind of pointed at the intake fans or where the intake fans blow in. And uh, um, I thought I was going to have to do something way more complicated. It turns out you just point fans at each other and the air mixes amazingly well. So, so in our data center, uh, our intake temperature goes up to 43C. Why? Well, um, we always want to keep the cold aisle at the outside temperature or lower. And in San Diego, it can get up to, it, it can get up around 110 degrees sometimes, uh, rarely. And so um, that's kind of the max, the max temperature that we design everything for on the intake side. Exhaust side, we try to keep it, we try to keep it below like 55C. It generally stays around like 53 at the most. Um, so this is a picture of, uh, we buy a lot of used servers and it's kind of funny to see, uh, we have like, temperature history in the BMC of the servers, so you can see like, oh, well, what, what did the, what was this server, what was the temperature this server was like in its previous life before we bought it? And you can see, you know, it runs around 21C in some, you know, beautiful climate controlled data center, and then uh, we have a peak temperature of 42 there once it starts running in our data center, so <laughs> we abuse them. Uh, you can find data on how much on how much power data centers often use on cooling, and it's crazy. Like I don't know if most people realize this, but it's not super uncommon for a data center to spend more power on the climate control, basically on air conditioning, than they give power to the servers. So that's not great. Like power is expensive, especially in California. We want to use as little power as possible for the for the uh, climate control and as much as possible for the uh, um, for the servers. So we do we do way better. We if all of our fans are running full power, we're using eight kilowatts, and that's less than four percent of all the power that uh, our data center uses. And we don't always use for uh, that that four percent or that eight kilowatts of power. In our old office, we had fans that were just on or off. They were either full speed or, or they were zero. Uh, and that made the climate control a lot more difficult to, to reach a desired temperature and, and stay stable and so forth. So now we have variable speed control fans. Um, this picture on the right here is a VFD. Uh, we just have, you know, they're just three phase motors and you can use a VFD to basically scale the, uh, the voltage and the frequency up. Um, and then we can run the fan at any speed based on, on that. Um, there's, there's one other big benefit to this, which is um, if you have big fans, when you turn them on, they draw like huge power initially. So each of these fans, if you just like flip a switch and they suddenly get power, for a period of time, they're gonna draw 80 amps each. Um, and so um, when they're running, once they get up and spinning full speed, uh, then they only use like five amps or less. So the problem is, is if you don't have something like a, a VFD controlling your fans, then what happens is, is you have to leave all this overhead uh, power that you can't really give to your servers because, well, what if the fans need to turn on? Uh, so these VFDs were really important in maximizing the amount of power that was available to the servers so that we didn't have to leave all this, all this power overhead available just to turn on the fans. So these VFDs basically limit, you can configure how they work, but we basically limit them to the max power that the fan uses at full speed. So if our fans are using five amps when they're running full speed, we don't let it draw more than five amps as it ramps up to, uh, as it gets started and ramps up speed. For the climate control, uh, 
we wrote software that we wrote custom software that does the climate control. We have these temperature sensors. This is a picture of one of the one of the temperature sensors here that we have throughout the room. Uh, basically, the inputs to the climate control system is the temperature and the humidity. Um, so what we want to do is we want to maintain a humidity of 30 to 40 percent inside the room. We actually don't directly, uh, it's kind of unintuitive, but we don't try to control the temperature in the room, we try to control the humidity. Uh, and since we're in San Diego, we don't have any problems where like it's both high temperature and high humidity. So anytime it's really hot, it's not humid outside. So uh, since that's the case, uh, this, I guess this works for us. It obviously wouldn't work for everyone. And so, uh, yeah, so we're, we're just always trying to achieve a 30 to 40% humidity. And the reason that we're so focused on humidity is because we've had a lot of problems in our garage data centers with humidity, uh, because when the humidity gets really high, especially if it's dirty, that dust holds some moisture and moisture on metal uh, is gonna cause corrosion. So we need to keep the humidity below the point where corrosion will happen. Uh, and so that's why we, we manage the humidity and try to keep it down below that 40% line for sure. So the way our, we have a pretty darn simple climate control algorithm. Basically, it, uh, it takes the input of the temperature sensors in the room to get the humidity of the room and the temperature of the, ro the room currently uh, to figure out like the relative humidity then um, we know we want to target this 30 to 40 percent. We come up with a temperature that will achieve that 30 to 40 percent, and then we vary the speeds of the fans to um, using a PID controller until we reach that, that target temperature. Um, so yeah, it's pretty basic. Basically, if the relative humidity is too high, we need to make it hotter because as you raise the temperature, the relative humidity of the air will come down. And if it's too cold, uh, or I'm sorry, if it's too cold, the relative humidity will be too high. We need to raise the temperature. And um, so we, we recirculate the air in that case. And then, yeah, if the, uh, if the relative humidity is too high, then, or I'm sorry, if the relative humidity is too low, well, generally the outside air has higher humidity than what's in the room. So we're exchanging the outside air and bringing that in. Um, and then obviously we have like the mixing going on so that we can, uh, we can basically take the high humidity air that's coming in, shoot hot air at it from the backside of the servers and get our desired relative humidity um, on, the cold, uh, on the cold aisle side of the servers. So this is it. This is what it all looks like now. Uh, we now have approximately 55.88 petaflops of B float 16 performance. So we basically 10 x our, our uh, <clears throat> with all these fancy new servers we bought. Uh, well, a lot of them are used. I shouldn't say that. New to us. Um, we now have about 10 x the, uh, the throughput. And uh, we ended up spending about uh, $1.5 million. So I mentioned, I think, that the, all the electrical stuff cost us like $125,000. Um, all the ventilation stuff cost us like another $75,000. Some of the equipment that I'm counting here uh, is like money we already spent. So like those, those, that's included in this total. And then we bought you know, additional servers up to this, up to this number here, basically. Um, so. So how does that compare to other supercomputers? So all we care, since all we care about is B-Float 16 performance, it's, it's not exactly straightforward to compare it, but we can come up with something relatively meaningful. Uh, this top 500 list, maybe you've heard of it before, it's like the top 500 supercomputers in the world. It's not like a comprehensive list. You submit to be on it if you want to. Uh, we don't, and part of the reason why is because, well, this is, this is uh, FP64 performance, which like, who uses that, but if you look at this list and you find, um, I looked through this list and I found some systems with modern GPUs, and uh, if you find systems around like four petaflops of FP64 with modern GPUs, uh, they, have around, they have around 60 petaflops of BFLOAT16 performance, and those are around like the 175, certainly above the 200 mark. 
Uh, so in terms of BFLOAT 16 performance, we're somewhere comparable to like 175 to 200 on this very narrow axis at least. And um, uh, just for BFLOAT 16 performance, and if they have modern GPUs, some of these are like all CPU systems and just you know not really comparable at all. So the high level specs, we use about 205 kilowatts of power when all the servers are running uh, full tilt. Uh, we have 5,088 CPU cores, which is actually a very small number. Uh, we have 640 GPUs. Some of the GPUs, we've got all the hardware. Some of the GPUs are still being installed, but that's what we have uh, in the room, just not quite some of them aren't in the servers yet. Uh, and 2.1 petabytes of solid state storage. So we have kind of two classes of servers uh, in this system. Uh, we have servers that train the models, and then we have what we call rollout servers uh, that feed the trainers. So the trainers, they each have eight GPUs. Um, that's 2.64 petaflops of VFLOAT 16 performance combined for all eight of those. They have 100 gigabit ethernet and 400 gigabit InfiniBand. So the, the 100 gigabit ethernet is basically feeding data into the servers and the InfiniBand that's to uh, sync across the servers. So one of the things that we do now that we didn't really do before is we often train models on multiple, like train the same model on multiple servers at the same time. Uh, so we have this massive bandwidth to sync data between the GPUs uh, on our trainer servers. Um, so yeah, we spend about 25,000 on each of these servers and uh, for the trainers, we generally buy new hardware um, to get us the, the, you can actually generally get the most dollars per flop um, buying some newer stuff. So the rollout servers, they are these two EU servers that look like this. They, we, we shove two GPUs in them um, for running models. They have 238 teraflops of BFLOAT 16 performance. Then we have another two GPUs for decoding frames. I'll talk about that more a little bit later here. Uh, they have 20 gigabits of ethernet. Uh, we have 100 of these, so uh, they, don't need, they don't need massive uh, ethernet connectivity. And then some of them are part of our distributed file system that stores all our driving data. Um, if they do, they have this 40 terabytes of storage currently. You can kind of see in the picture here, up high they have some disk drives in them, down low they don't. So like those top ones there are, are uh, we, we have dual purpose rollout servers. They're both uh, part of our distributed file system and also uh, for rollout. Um, so the 2,500 that we spend per server on these servers doesn't include the storage. Um, that's just everything else that's in there. Uh, we build these so cheap because we, uh, we buy all this, I think everything in these servers is used, except for the disk drives, I guess, um, which isn't in that 2,500 anyway. So that distributed file system that I was talking about, it has all of our driving data that we use for training the models. Um, so currently I looked and we have 3.84 million segments what we call a segment is a one minute clip of driving. It has both some video files and a log file for each segment. And we store it in the key value store. Our distributed file system is this key value store called mini key value. I talked about it in great detail in my talk two years ago, if you're interested in how that works. Um, but yeah, it's basically a key value store that we wrote that's super simple. We looked at all the other options and they're like, crazy complex and we just needed something super, super simple. It's less than a thousand lines of code. That driving data, uh, it's from 11,000 unique devices. So we've got a lot of, we've got a pretty good amount of data diversity now. Uh, we generally have, I don't think we've ever been limited by data diversity up to this point at least. Um, so 11,000 devices is basically like 11,000 vehicles. 191 platforms or, or types of vehicles uh, cover those 11,000 devices, and uh, 66 countries. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, data from a lot of different countries. When we build our training lists, uh, we kind of pick a slice of this data, like the best slice, because uh, we often do things like say, oh well, most of our data is from the U.S., but we also want data from other countries and so forth. We want to keep things like balanced, so. 
Um, so yeah, we, we uh, kind of slice and dice and, and uh, take a subset of all this data to uh, build our training lists for training models for OpenPilot. So the first step, or kind of the, the start of the data flow through the whole training process is reading those video files. Uh, those video files are, you know, recorded on their, you know, real people driving their, uh, driving their commas, their comma devices. Um, the comma devices encode that video in H.265, and one of the first things we need to do is decode those frames. Um, and so, part of the reason that our um, our rollout servers have both two GPUs for running models and two GPUs just to get more decoders is because we need to decode, we need to do so much video decoding of these H.265 files. Uh, so that whole, that whole rollout system that we have can decode 300,000 frames per second. Uh, and then, so that's mainly the, uh, the two GPUs, two GPUs with, used for decoding. Then those frames feed into the models that are, for example, our simulator. Um, and those, uh, those GPUs in the rollout servers they can output 200,000 FPS uh, once we get all the GPUs up in all those servers. The models that we train for OpenPilot, that actually uh, output the plan for OpenPilot, um, it's a kind of a two-step, we, we train two models, basically, is what I'm trying to say for that. Uh, the, the input to those models is like the road camera, the frames, the first model, the vision model, takes in those frames and outputs a feature vector. Uh, so that's one model we train, that vision model. Then that feature vector is input into uh, the policy model, and the policy model um, takes in the feature vector and outputs the plan that OpenPilot executes. So just to give you an idea of what the size of these models are, the vision model which takes in frames, outputs features, it's two efficient nets at 21.47 million parameters. Uh, and to give you an idea of the speed up we achieved by uh, moving from the old office to the new office, uh, basically we went from 12 hours in the old office to four hours in the new office. So quite an improvement, uh, really increased our REPL time, which is great. Uh, so that was the first model. The second one, the policy model that we have to train, that one is an MLP with 5.3 million parameters. It used to take us 21 hours to train. Now it only takes us seven. So now we're like 11 hours now to uh, train the models that we need to train to ship, um, to ship OpenPilot. So that's pretty cool. So uh, we did a pretty good job. 1.5 million is pretty cheap for everything we built. Um, the supercomputer that was like the closest in that top 500 list that gave similar performance, um, that's like at minimum a $3.75 million computer for sure. And that doesn't include like the building or you know, like all the, the power and ventilation and so forth that, we, that I included in you know, what we spent on ours. So we did pretty good in terms of dollars per flops, um, but we can do a lot better. And uh, you know, maybe in two years, my next talk, is going to be talking about the uh, tiny boxes in our data center. We'll see. Tiny <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any questions? What's up? Yeah, so the question was, uh, are we like unique in running a high temperature data center? And he mentioned that like in Iceland, they like do stuff, uh, uh, different, you know, kind of different setups. Uh, I've definitely heard of like high temperature data centers before. I don't know like what, uh, my background is not data centers. I was a web, I was a web slash application developer before I worked at Kama, uh, who migrated a big company into the cloud. 
uh, worked on cloud infrastructure at Kama and said, wow, this is expensive and stupid. We should buy more servers. Uh, and that's how I kind of fell into this. So, um, so I don't have like industry experience on this, but I've definitely read about other high temperature data centers. Uh, what temperature that is, I guess I'm not really sure. Uh, and I'm sure they do it for dollar reasons. Um, but uh, yeah, it definitely works. I mean, I don't know why baby, I don't, why, I don't know why people baby their servers so much, I guess. The, like our reliability in terms of uh, temperature, I don't think we've had anything due, failed due to temperature. In any, if anything, all our failures were due to corrosion. And the only way we get corrosion is if it's too cold in our data center. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. Uh, go ahead, yeah. You're so awesome. Uh, <laughs> I agree. Thank you. Hello, I have a question regarding word usage. I noticed that you mentioned the word data center quite often. And I was watching the GeoHots podcast with Lex Friedman a few weeks ago, a few days ago. And I noticed that he was reluctant on using the word data usage because you guys don't have air conditioning. You guys have fans. And <laughs> yeah, so he said it's not a data center because you're using fans. So my question is, what are your thoughts on this? But also second case, did you do any cost analysis on fan usage? Because you use really big fans versus air conditioning. Ah. Uh. Yeah, so, I mean, I did some cost analysis to, you know, know, like, I knew what it was going to cost to buy air conditioning units that were going to do, you know, 200, what was it, 205 kilowatt, cooling 200 kilo, 205 kilowatts of power consumption, you know, because that, that all turns into heat. And that's, like, crazy expensive. Uh, now, we bought big fans. Um, I found, like, some models that said, like, if your temperature difference is this many C, you need this many CFM you know, exchanged to, uh, you know, bring the temperature down this much and so forth. So I kind of ran some rough numbers, bought fans considerably bigger than that, I think, uh, and then felt safe that it was going to work. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Is that your only server room, or what do you have for backup solution in case, like, there's no power in San Diego for, like, three days? Yeah, so I didn't really talk about our production-facing infrastructure. Um, this is all for research. So anything production facing is in uh, is in a cloud provider. We use Azure for uh, for our customer facing infrastructure. Um, this stuff it'd be really annoying if this stuff went down, but uh, we're fine with you know some reliability issues and uh, basically we exchange uh, you know part of the reason that we can do this so cheap compared to the cloud. One of the reasons we don't run this in the cloud and we can do it so much cheaper is because. We're not striving for some crazy number of nines uptime. I mean, we are, but we'll accept some downtime to save massive, massive amounts of money. Um, and but we can, you know, like I don't know how much downtime we've had. I guess I haven't really calculated it, which obviously means it hasn't been a problem. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, we don't run it in the cloud because it's too expensive compared to what we've done. Uh, and we know that uh, we know that like the re our return on investment is you know I if you include like the cost of the room and everything uh, just for the servers it's like six months or something like that that we that we are better off so uh, with the room it's longer but still it's uh, we know it's way cheaper than the other alternatives. So I have a question regarding the vision model. But what do you use to supervise this uh, efficient night? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but the research people would. You should find Yusin or someone, or Harold. He's speaking next. OK, yes. You should ask that question to the next person. <laughs> I have a question regarding the GPUs that you use. It yeah. seems the server is very cheap. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, so what's the, what's the GPU used for the training, and what's for the uh, inference? Yeah, so for training, the cheapest dollars per flop, whatever that is, that's what we buy. For training, we need the most dollars per flop. <laughs> you, you, I, you know what? You tell me. Because if you find something better, I would love to know, and I want to buy them. <laughs> and, then, so that, and then you asked also for the, for the rollout servers. Yeah. So that we actually need the highest uh, memory bandwidth per flop. 
because uh, we run much bigger models, um, and so the models don't fit in cache, and when the models don't fit in cache, you end up memory bandwidth limited because you're running batch size one on your rollout. Uh, so for those, it's the cheapest memory bandwidth per flop. Yes, I uh, also have another question regarding the training of the, uh, the model. It seems like there are two models, the perception model first, and then there's a policy model. Yes. And I thought it's end-to-end it's -end training should be. So how, how, is that, how do you train these models separately? Should, shouldn't you do this end-to-end? Uh, -end? Great question for you seeing the next person. Okay, <laughs> Save that one. We got a few more questions. Uh, uh, so you mentioned it takes uh, four hours to train the vision model. Uh, do you mean the uh, whole training process or just one epoch of the model? What was the first part? Uh, you mentioned it takes four hours to train the vision model and yeah. seven hours to train the MMP model. Uh -huh. So does it, mean, uh, does it mean the whole training process or just one epoch? The whole oh, the whole, yeah, the whole training process. Oh, the whole training process? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yep. Those models are fully trained in, in that many hours and ready, like, potential candidates to ship. Well, I guess they have to be merged and tested and all that stuff, but... Hey, uh, first, quick, uh, uh, a quick comment on the hot data center thing. Why don't more people do that? I did actually ask this question by happenstance, one of my old tech leads, and he said, well, it'd be too hot for the people in the data center. Yeah. And that was his answer. It is hot in there. Yeah, it's pretty, yeah. Yeah. Um, Sometimes but, it's cold in the rest of the office, though. It, it's actually, it can be refreshing when you walk in there. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I'm not really sure. I think a lot of, I think it's becoming way more common. I, I swear I've read about some Microsoft data centers that are all fans, and like, if you look up like fan walls, you'll find data centers that have like a giant fan wall. Um, I feel like that's like kind of gone by the wayside now, and that was like a multi-year ago thing now, and they're doing something else, but it definitely, I don't know, I might even be like a generation behind. There's like better stuff now, probably. Wow. Well, I do have an actual question for you, which is, yeah. um, that was very interesting. I will look up a fan wall. Um, I want one, but <laughs> um, better than a plant wall. What's, uh, has anybody that you know of achieved a lower all-in cost per petaflop for training than, than you guys? I, again, I don't really have any experience in like uh, industry infrastructure, like server data center building stuff, so I really don't know. I think a lot um, of this information is just not public either. Uh, I promise you the answer is no. <laughs> okay. I'm working on this with Tiny Core. I Tiny Core because it goes 2x under commas, and commas are ready 2x under anything else. Okay, so we're 2x under anything else George has seen. Uh, I guess we did a good job. I just did the best I could do. Uh, and I always tell people I don't really know what I'm doing. So I guess, you know why You know why it's so good? It's because this is our third data center, right? So we iterated. <laughs> yeah, we think this one is good, but two more, and it'll, we'll be saying this one was horrible, I'm sure. Going back to temperature, so you said 50-something degrees Celsius was about as hot as it gets. Do you have any idea, like, what you're seeing on the actual dye? I imagine it's some number. Oh, uh, I mean, the GPUs... They throttle it somewhere around 88C on the GPUs, something like that. Um, I'm sure the exhaust gets above 60, but then it expands out into the room. Um, so, yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm trying to think of any other temperatures I know. Yeah, that's that's the best I can guess. We got time for one more question. <clears throat> Anyone? There's someone up here. Oh, thanks, Greg. So thanks for the talk. Um, how long does it take to boot up a supercomputer? Do you have to do it in stages or in just? Uh, how long does it take to what the supercomputer? Bo boot, boot, boot up. Uh, to build it? No, boot. Oh, to start? If you power everything off and then turn back on, how, how long does it boot? Most of the, I mean, most of the servers boot and are ready to run things in, I think, under three minutes. We're actually talking about, like, saving even more on power by shutting off, like, 40% of them and then, like, turning them on uh, when they're needed. So, 
Um, individual servers, they take like three minutes or so, and you know, they all start in parallel, so it should be on the order of minutes, single digit minutes. I don't know where you see one. Oh, we got one more question. Uh, real quick, uh, percent-wise, like let's say on a 30C day, what percentage were you running your, uh, your your fans at? And do you run the exhaust and then take fans at different speeds? Uh, so sometimes we run the exhaust fans and we don't run the intake fans. And so part of that is because um, you saw like there's like baffles on the fans and they're just uh, they're just like mechanical baffles. So we need to run the fans fast enough that the baffles open up. So there's kind of a minimum fan speed that we need to run the fans at. Uh, so we don't run them all at the same speed. We kind of support using them in a staged manner to, uh, to get like a lower airflow than if they're all running at low speed. Uh, so for example, like sometimes we run the exhaust fans and we don't run the intake fans and say they're running at like 30%. Uh, that's that's somewhat less airflow than if we run the the exhaust fans and the intake fans at um, at that 30 percent. So uh, so yeah, we kind of do that. But generally, that we're doing that because the humidity is getting too high, and then we also have the recirculation going on that's helping raise it at the same time, basically. And then real quick, I know y'all said you. I know years prior you had a data sales thing, like for like 200,000 a month. Did anybody actually buy it? I'm not aware of anyone, no. <laughs> as far as I know, no one's ever taken us up on that. <laughs> we do sell a lot of meetings, though. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Greg. Yeah, thanks a lot.